CEO and co-founder Yanni Asia, and two of our UK popular investors, Jay Smith and Liam Davies. Jay, who trades under Jay Nemesis, is up 84% in the last 12 months, while Liam Davies is up approximately 121% in the same time. Gentlemen, nice to have you here in person. Yanni, why don't you uh, do the honors? Perfect. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here with two of our top uh, crypto traders uh, on eToro. So just, uh, I think about a month ago, we had a webinar a bit more than a month ago, and I said I'm, uh, we're going to add Ethereum soon, and you were excited about that. Since then, uh, we've launched Ethereum. It started at, uh, I think we, we originally put it on the platform, it was $8, then it started moving up and up and up. And then uh, just after the Bitcoin ETF disappointment, it soared uh, to $45, uh, where it's now ranging 40 to 45. So we want to take this opportunity. I'll do like very high level macro, uh, our history uh, in Toro uh, with Ethereum and the, di the big differences between Ethereum uh, and, uh, and the Bitcoin blockchain. So a uh, very quick reminder. Uh, we've been in eToro exploring the blockchain technology since uh, 2011, uh, really early on, uh, and uh, around that we've also built uh, something called Colored Coins, which has taken the concept of the Bitcoin blockchain, which was revolutionary, but allowed only to move Bitcoins from one place to another, and we've created an open source layer on top of that called Colored Coins, which enables you, uh, in theory, to issue assets like Euro coin, dollar coin, uh, and even maybe Apple coin. Uh, and uh, we've built that. Uh, we've uh, uh, eventually actually spun that off to a separate company, which also raised money, uh, called Kalu, which does digital currencies. It recently actually launched the Liverpool Pound. So uh, we're very much engaged in the blockchain and Bitcoin community. And back then, when we worked on colored coins, uh, interestingly enough, Vitalik Buterin uh, sat in our office for two weeks. Vitalik is the genius founder of uh, Ethereum, and when we worked on the Colored Coins project, uh, he constantly said that there are limits to what the Bitcoin technology can do. Uh, and I remember uh, we wanted to set up around Colored Coins something called Chromium, and eventually after Bitcoin left Israel and went to the U.S., uh, he started building Ethereum, and the concept of Ethereum and why it's extremely different than Bitcoin, so we constantly say Bitcoin is digital gold, potentially, or uh, the money of the internet, because it enables people to move basically a digital asset from one place to another. Uh, some, some people don't even understand. It enables people to actually hold a digital asset themselves, which uh, prior to Bitcoin that never really existed. But it's still sort of a, just a linear asset, it's a Bitcoin. With colored coins, it could be also other coins. But Ethereum and Vitalik took that a step further. They created what's called smart contracts. And the Ethereum basically built in, in the blockchain of Ethereum, you can actually run complete uh, Turing complete code, which basically means anything a computer can do, now you can do on the Ethereum blockchain. But the reason it's interesting that it's in a blockchain is because if, in theory, Bitcoin or blockchain uh, 1.0 could replace all forms of money and digitize government money uh, and money all around the world and disrupt the banking system, Ethereum takes that a step further and potentially, and this is very long term, disrupts the entire legal framework, governance framework, accounting framework, because you could do any type of agreement as a smart contract, which means it's, you can use computers to analyze it. So if every contract in the world was a smart contract, which you could actually verify through code who's the right thing, you didn't need any lawyers. Uh, well, that would be a, a beautiful world. Um, and uh, sorry, sorry for all the lawyers here on the <laughs> webinar. My mom's a lawyer, so I'm allowed uh, uh, to do lawyer jokes. Um, but that's really the the revolutionary thing about Ethereum is the understanding you can create any type of software program, you can upload it to the cloud, and amazingly it will work in a decentralized way. So that code will now run on thousands upon thousands of computers, and even if you're the person who wrote the code, potentially you could create that code to run in an autonomous way, so outside of basically your control. 
Now, not for this first session about Ethereum, maybe in three months we'll talk also about how this is potentially the real rise of artificial intelligence. Maybe this is the, the, the process towards singularity because suddenly code could run uh, and uh, even develop itself uh, on the cloud uh, without the hand of humans. Uh, and, that, and, that's, and that's really mind-blowing uh, because it creates really self-governing code on the cloud, uh, super interesting. And that's also why we added it uh, on eToro. So we've, we've made a decision on eToro. We want to add cryptocurrencies when they reach a, a certain threshold. Uh, so just like in stocks, uh, we add only markets that are the top markets, most liquid markets around the world. Uh, so, so there's always liquidity, there are good spreads. Um, and uh, we said, let's add these cryptocurrencies every time they reach a billion dollar market cap. And in, in Ethereum, this was really, we added it just when it was hovering around a billion and then boom, suddenly it's now three, three to four billion dollars. So we saw that huge spike. I'll let Jay talk more about that spike that we saw, but a lot of it because the Bitcoin ETF sort of made some of the Bitcoiners somewhat disappointed that it's not becoming a, a real, let's say, institutional great asset. And it's, uh, Jay just said a great quote. He said, it's easier to move from Bitcoin to Ethereum than it is to move from Bitcoin to pounds. So people just <laughs> bought Ethereum. And in fact, that, that was a huge driver. Uh, there's a, another um, uh, interesting debate right now on the internet we'll talk about later on, which is the potential Bitcoin fork. Uh, so again, politics uh, are creating somewhat of a stain on the Bitcoin community. Uh, there's a discussion of potentially the Bitcoin sl splitting into two. So again, people are moving their Bitcoins into Ethereum uh, where uh, you have Vitalik, so you have a better governance uh, so far. Um, and we've seen in eToro, and that's quite amazing, we've seen in the last uh, month since we've launched Ethereum, eToro, uh, Ethereum, uh, not of Ethereum uh, yet, uh, <laughs> so Ethereum has become one of the top five traded markets on eToro. So we have currencies from all over around the world, from UN to Euro to Pound. Uh, we've got stocks like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Facebook, Twitter, Snap, <laughs> but none that we've got the biggest indices in the world, commodities, gold, silver, oil, but the, one of the top five traded instruments suddenly on the platform became Ethereum just a month from, from where we launched it, and that really shows that a lot of people are both interested in this new technology um, and the fact that obviously it's, it's much harder to buy Ethereum uh, out there. Uh, it's even harder to buy Ethereum than it is to buy Bitcoin, uh, and we're very happy to make a, a very simple process for people from all around the world to easily invest uh, uh, in Ethereum. Um, it is important to note um, that all cryptocurrencies, very risky assets. So I just came here from an asset manager managing about $600 billion pitching them with the, uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, and they said, like, how can you invest in something that has no underlying financials? So important to note, uh, the, there's no limit. So a lot of the, uh, us Bitcoin and crypto enthusiasts believe Bitcoin will reach $5,000 and, and we'll see our, uh, and our kids will see Bitcoin maybe at uh, $50,000. Um, but uh, we need to remember that at the same time, it could suddenly go to zero. Um, if, if something breaks, again, a lot of people are working on it, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, we need to remember that volatility and uh, whatever comes up could also come down. Um, and uh, again, this is a, 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 a community driven by people eventually. So that's really a big part of what's amazing about Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's built by people. It's not centrally government, uh, centrally governed like uh, government money. Uh, it's not a stock which is a specific market running on some specific accounting principles, it's open source code, uh, which defines some rules and behavior of that open source code. Uh, and what really builds it is the fact that people use it as a payment method, as a store of value. So what creates the value of both Bitcoin and Ethereum and every cryptocurrency is only the fact that people believe in it and people hold it, 
and uh, uh, you know I'm an uh, I'm an optimist, so I say there's there's no limit to love, right? There's no limit to how much people believe in something, but that's really what's holding it together, the entire cryptocurrency community, which is why it's great to have uh, two awesome cryptocurrency traders uh, with us, Matt. Yeah, well, you. well, Jay, I suppose, why don't you do the honors and tell us, you know, why why did you join Etoro and when? Um, I joined Etoro. Uh, not long after the first Bitcoin bubble, actually. Uh, it was, I think it was only a few weeks after it was first added to eToro. Um, I've obviously been in Bitcoin uh, since late 2012, early 2013, so I've seen the comings and goings of all these huge bubbles and a lot of other different cryptocurrencies. Ethereum is one of the first ones I actually got excited about. Um, I also trade um, stocks, mainly in technology and stuff, um, so companies like Microsoft and IBM and uh, AMD, all of whom, well, not all of whom, but a lot of whom actually uh, invest in the Bitcoin and blockchain uh, ecosystem as well. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, we also have Liam Davies here. So Liam, why don't you answer the same question? Why did you join eToro and when? Yeah, so I joined uh, around the end of 2013. Um, I was just bored in an office job looking for somewhere else to to play with money and uh, yeah I found eToro because it's quite exciting to uh, invest in other people and have them do the work for you but now I do the work myself uh, investing in cryptos which is it's uh, very volatile but very exciting. Okay Yanni you've already explained a little bit what Ethereum is but why don't you maybe talk about the long-term value of what could really drive the price? So uh, there is a, a significant difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin in the long-term value analysis uh, where, bit, first of all, Bitcoin has limited supply. So we all know Bitcoin has 21 million Bitcoins. That's all we'll ever have of Bitcoins. Uh, and, and therefore, scarcity plays a big role in Bitcoin price or long-term price. Long -term price. So if you say that in... 20 years, there are going to be 100 million people who each own one Bitcoin. That's impossible because you have only 21 million uh, Bitcoins. So that increases indefinitely the price of Bitcoin. What's interesting in Ethereum is Ethereum doesn't, did not limit supply. So currently, uh, basically, miners will be able to keep on mining uh, Ethereum. Uh, even more interestingly, uh, again, Ethereum is still a live organism because Vitalik is still managing it, so it's not like Bitcoin where one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is like Satoshi wrote this thing and that's it. That's also one of the problems now with Bitcoin, <laughs> but Ethereum have, has still a lot of things written in its white paper that haven't even been developed. One of them is the fact that Vitalik says that at some point Ethereum will move from, from proof of work, which is mining, which is how Bitcoins are created and Ethereum is created, it'll move to proof of stake, uh, where proof of stake basically means that the people who actually own Ethereum are the ones mining it and creating the security for it, uh, rather than CPU power. Um, and, and that, for example, is one of the things that you have the hardcore Bitcoiners who don't believe in Ethereum say like, okay, there is a problem here in fungibility because things can still move in the Ethereum world, we don't know where it's still exactly all of the rules of the game. But what we do know, which is very interesting, which is why people who do invest in Ethereum think it's a great opportunity, Ethereum is actually used within the Ethereum ecosystem. So the Ethereum is an operating platform. Uh, it's like, you know, like Microsoft or Apple. It's actually an operating system where you can develop applications using code uh, writing it in Solidity, uh, and then upload that code into the cloud, into the operating system, and then that code can, can run. But in order to compute, that code needs to use Ethereum. So Ethereum is actually the currency used by the code to run CPU power uh, uh, on the cloud. Uh, so unlike Bitcoin, where there is a question regarding the utility of Bitcoin, uh, uh, the utility of Ethereum, the currency itself, uh, the gas, is actually for coders running code on the platform. So if you write a brilliant piece of code that can now run in order to compute it, it actually consumes Ethereum, um, which, again, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with, 
uh, but uh, that, that's the reason Ethereum has value because let's say JP Morgan now says, let's rewrite some of our, I don't know, bond issuance practices on the Ethereum uh, uh, blockchain, they need to buy $200 million of Ethereum to actually make sure that they can run it for a while. So uh, there were some rumors recently that one of the big banks said, okay, let, let's try to test something on Ethereum, but then sent an analyst and told them, tell me how much Ethereum will we need if this actually succeeds and it's now running for 10 years. And he said, I don't know, 100 million. And the, then one of the big banks just went and bought 100 million. <laughs> you don't need more than that to raise the Ethereum price to, uh, to $40. Um, so that's, that's a, a big part of the futuristic value and the long-term value of Ethereum is the fact that there's a real utility for Ethereum within the ecosystem. I don't know, are you familiar with it uh, a bit more, how it works? Um, I've never actually used it, but yeah, my, my understanding is that unlike whereas Bitcoin has uh, a lot of different types of payments built into it, so you can do things like set up multiple people in charge of an account, all of whom have to agree and sign to send a transaction. With Ethereum, there is only one type, which is send it from one address to another. Um, and so once it reaches some address, uh, an address that is assigned with a smart contract, I believe it basically burns that theory and that theory is gone um, and it starts that contract. Um, so that contract could be anything from um, selling a house or through to uh, a ride, decentralized ride sharing app or something like that. Um, that that's my understanding of how it works. Um, Liam, how did you get together? Let's get some. So we, me, me and Jay had some uh, some time together in the last webinar. Tell us a bit about your interest uh, in cryptocurrencies and your understanding of what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, my interest is um, it's more in the decentralization, you know, in the the kind of the free world sort of concept. Um, I'm still researching all the technical aspects of things. Um, but yeah, I think the the gas system it's it's uh, seems to be at a fixed price the whole time. So whatever, like Jay said, whatever the um, the application, it's always going to be um, a particular amount of Ethereum. I think it's like one one hundred thousandth of an ether uh, is consumed every time you make a transaction. So. Yeah, you would need some kind of capital in Ether to be able to run a, a program long term, like you were saying. Are you a programmer, Liam? Uh, no, I'm an engineer, an engineer by trade, and in the future I'll be a, a student again, a mature student. <laughs> okay, it's time, so it's time studying uh, Ethereum more deeply. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, there's been a bit of a, a price, uh, a serious price rise in the last few weeks, Liam. Why don't you open up and uh, talk about why it's really moved in the last month or so? Yeah, so there was um, some developer conference recently uh, to do with Ethereum. I think Vitalik was there and lots of other people. Um, there's a lot of big companies that are investing in the, uh, the Hyperledger which, you know, is uh, blockchain technologies for business, basically. Companies including uh, Intel, Microsoft, you mentioned JP Morgan. Uh, I also heard rumors of some kind of pump and dump going on uh, when the price rocketed around $50 or whatever it was. Uh, some people manipulating the market there. Uh, so yeah, those are the two main aspects I think are behind the recent price hike. Anything to add on that? Well, there's also the story that broke. So there's the Bitcoin ETF, that's one driver. People moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum. There's the hype of big companies going not only to Hyperledger, but actually there was I'm not sure exactly whether it's already rumors or proof rumors, but uh, what's called Ethereum Enterprise. Yeah, that's so, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, there's, so basically, they're setting up a consortium of mm -hmm. banks and technology companies to set up potentially a, a separate Ethereum called Ethereum Enterprise, which will be a permission-based Ethereum. So Ethereum, and generally the blockchain industry, 
uh, the blockchain, let's say, uh, the crypto industry, is a lot about permissionless, which means everything is open to everybody. Uh, from, from the financial services companies who are looking at the space are extremely concerned because they look at the regulations of anti-money laundering, KYC, uh, who's allowed to do what, uh, different participants. So within the, uh, there's a couple of big players, Hyperledger is one of them, uh, Digital Asset Holding, uh, which is led by an ex uh, JP Morgan, uh, Blyth Meister is, is another one of them. Uh, there's Corda, which is developed by R3, uh, which is also one of them. Uh, we've had some history, by the way, at Etoro, which with each of them. Um, and they all are building sort of blockchain for financial services, for big companies to use blockchain. Now, the crypto guys are looking at that and, and saying that that's not blockchain at all. We're just building a distributed database. Don't, don't, call, don't call this crypto if you're <laughs> closing it. Um, and then the fact that they went into Ethereum let the entire crypto community say, okay, so they're giving up. They're, co they're coming towards us to, to build uh, something around Ethereum. I think that was also a big driver. Um, and then the third is the obvious, which we all need to remember, uh, the Dutch tulips. So you can see it on Google Trends. Once something goes up 100% a week, people start talking about it. Why? Because uh, I'm assuming, without looking at the specific uh, week, that both Jay and Liam made probably 50% that week. They probably told some of their friends what they did. Uh, <laughs> and then people start talking about Ethereum, and then we saw a huge spike in the search traffic for Ethereum. You can see it in one of the blog posts we wrote. You saw it just skyrocketed. So what happens is real fundamental news, Ethereum Enterprise, which is uh, uh, for externals uh, to put in money in Ethereum, uh, so real dollars into Ethereum. The Bitcoin ETF disappointed. Bitcoiners moving into Ethereum. That rises the price, but then suddenly the herd effect comes into play, and when the herd effects come, that spikes the price further. Now, whether or not that's stable or not really depends if you have, uh, as Leah mentioned, uh, pumpers and dumpers, uh, it, or, or these are real people with vested interest. Uh, so the current assumption, by the way, it's, it's it's actually a bit of a bit relaxed. I actually haven't heard any rumors about pump and dump, so <laughs> you'll need to tell us more about that. For now I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe it's just me spending too much time on Reddit, but you know. <laughs> That's what I saw it. <laughs> but it is normally you get market hysteria once that something rockets. So I mean, we even experienced it with Bitcoin back in January when the price started to take off in December. We had a lot of interest in Bitcoin, a lot of new accounts coming in from Bitcoin. So it yeah. is always dangerous territory when you when you see that. But um, okay, well, look, why don't we why don't we talk about uh, your trading strategy? So Jay, maybe maybe you can elaborate a little bit on your trading strategy. Uh, yeah. So surrounding. Um Ethereum and, and Bitcoin specifically. Uh, probably any of my copiers will notice that at the moment I hold no, no Bitcoin at all. Uh, that's basically because of the hard fork uh, decision that's coming up. Um, in combination with the fact that I moved most of it out to, to ride the Ethereum train. Um, I, think, uh, I think the hard fork situation, uh, regardless of which direction it ends up eventually going, uh, if um, Bitcoin Unlimited takes off or if um, Bitcoin Core takes off or if both of them actually work, which is also viable. Um, I think that the risk surrounding that is is huge um, because again, you know, we've we've seen on the unlimited side that uh, they recently re released a few patches and they did not go down very well. Um, a few a few bugs have been noticed, but in fact, there was one uh, one post I saw actually recently that was discussing the fact that they they released uh, code that was not open source, so nobody could review it, which obviously if you're running a node uh, and you are storing your own Bitcoins on that node, then you are risking your own Bitcoins because they could very easily just write a little line of code that says, move all your Bitcoins to my, to my wallet. Um, but I think once, once uh, that decision has been made, and I think that that will happen probably within the next three months because of the amount of of hysteria and hype that has surrounded it, and the fact that other cryptocurrencies are on the rise and people are a bit fearful and they want Bitcoin to continue moving forwards. I think um, because of that, 
the, there are a lot, there is a lot of volatility coming both in Bitcoin and in all of the surrounding markets, such as Ethereum, such as Dash, um, Monero, all of all of the slightly more widely trusted um, cryptocurrencies. So um, let's just take uh, for all the people here with us. Uh, uh, explain a bit what's happening, well, what's Bitcoin Unlimited, what's happening in Bitcoin, and also the fact that it actually did happen yes. in Ethereum, but, yes, uh, yeah. but a bit different. So very, very first of all, what's happening? So Bitcoin has been developed originally by a mysterious Satoshi, uh, then has been led basically by what's called the Bitcoin core team. So the code that is running, there are people who, is up, who are updating the code, that, that's the Bitcoin core team. Now, there's a, a lot of discussion for the past, since January, more than January last year, so the past two years. So I unfortunately sold Bitcoin last January because I got tired of the politics. <laughs> so I said, I'm selling, a fair, I'm selling Bitcoin and buying Netflix. Uh, that was, by the way, a mistake, uh, which I might not repeat now. But uh, the problem with the politics is Bitcoin code itself became extremely conservative. So to change a code in Bitcoin is extremely hard because they're seeking uh, consensus. They're seeking everybody to agree on what needs to be changed in, before they change it. They actually proposed a, a change in the code which should solve it, SegWit, but for some reason that's not gaining yeah. consensus. Maybe JJ can tell us a bit more why not. But the point is currently the Bitcoin blockchain is limited in its capacity to process transactions. The block size is 1K. In order uh, to process more transactions, there are a lot of transactions stuck in the Bitcoin blockchain. They can't get processed because of it. In order to process more transactions, they need to come up with a solution. Either SegWit, which is, let's say, the Bitcoin core solution, or now there is a group of developers who are saying, we have a simpler, better solution. Let's just increase the block size to 4K. There's some more data around that, which is more technical. But they chose basically, so what's the fork? So there is the core team, which says, let's develop it this way, SegWit. There is the Bitcoin Unlimited team saying, let's do it that way. Now, to add to that complexity, there are different uh, interest groups. There are the owners of Bitcoin, which would just want the value of Bitcoin to go up, period, and, and for it to always be protected by the best possible secured code. There are the miners who make money out of processing transactions. And it seems, I don't understand exactly why, it seems that the miners prefer the Bitcoin Unlimited solution to the SegWit solution. So basically, they're looking at the Bitcoin Unlimited solution. They're saying, we're going to make more money if we choose the, this group than the other group. So the miners are gradually choosing Bitcoin Unlimited, and there are the exchanges. And within the exchanges, we'll include also with Toro because our interest is very similar. We don't mind if uh, there is going to be a fork in general. More than that, I'll explain whether we'll, we, at this point, we already uh, prefer there is going to be a fork. Uh, we just want the fork to be organized. So the exchanges, the 18 of the exchanges basically grouped together and said, listen, if there's going to be a fork, that's fine. We're not taking sides. Uh, on, on which is the right solution. We're going to try and support both. But the old Bitcoin blockchain is going to call, be called Bitcoin. And the new one, even if it has better hashing power, is going to be called Bitcoin un Unlimited, BTU. Which basically means, a fork means that um, one, once it happens, so when does a fork happen? When 50% of the hash rate moves to the new code, to the Bitcoin Unlimited. Then suddenly you'll have some clients who are Bitcoin and some clients who are Bitcoin Unlimited. At that point, actually, what the exchanges did, in my opinion, is amazing. They said, listen, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. That's the price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin Unlimited, that's a new asset. It's going to be priced by supply and demand in the markets. So post fork, what will happen? Every person who has actually a wallet of Bitcoin suddenly is going to get one Bitcoin and one Bitcoin Unlimited. OK? Uh, we're also looking at eToro to see how we can solve that to people. So we're basically defining now that if you own only at one time leverage along on eToro Bitcoin before the fork, 
and let's say the fork is the X date, like a dividend or a split, we're going to uh, credit you uh, minus all the mess that's going to be because there might be, and, and all the exchanges are saying it, because right now, the big, they're actually, the biggest problem is Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin are actually attacking one another. So they were claiming they were going to disrupt each other's businesses, which is bad for everybody. Uh, and then we're going to enable people to buy Bitcoin Unlimited in Y date, which is when we'll support Bitcoin Unlimited. Okay, but since nobody actually knows whether Bitcoin Unlimited, where is going to be liquidity, who's going to support it, it's very hard to commit to those things. So that's exactly what, why what the exchanges did is a good thing. They created some certainty. What's that certainty? What they said is, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. There might be a new Bitcoin on the block called Bitcoin Unlimited, but Bitcoin is Bitcoin. Um, so, so that's very generally what's happening. Now, some extremists say this is the death of Bitcoin. If there's going to be a fork, it's going to be a death of Bitcoin. Uh, nobody will know which, which is the right Bitcoin anymore. But if you look at the history of Ethereum, what's interesting is there was a fork in the Ethereum fork. Oh, how long was it? Um, uh, in the past year. Um, yeah, just over a year ago. Yeah. So, so uh, in Ethereum, there was the DAO. I won't go into the details <laughs> of the DAO, but a very big, ambitious project of a decentralized autonomous organization. The DAO was hacked. Uh, and uh, basically, if uh, Vitalik, because there is one person managing uh, Ethereum, he could say, listen, I'm doing a hard fork. I'm reversing the hack. So what Vitalik said is, from now on, Ethereum is the new Ethereum, the fork of the new Ethereum. That's Ethereum. That's my Ethereum. And that Ethereum reverses the transaction of the hack. So nobody got hurt from the hack. It reversed everything. There's a group of people who said, we don't agree to the dictatorship of Vitalik. Therefore, uh, we want our own uh, Ethereum, which is uh, undetermined, so one person can change the rules, and that's called Ethereum Classic. And if you go into some of the exchanges out there, you'll actually find out that people who held Ethereum before now hold both Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. So for every Ethereum you held, uh, you now hold both Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, if you look at the value of Ethereum Classic, it's now, I think, $2.5. Yeah. Um, when it happened, it drove Ethereum price down, I think, to under 6 right, yeah, back then? Was a big crash. So, so there was a big crash in Ethereum when it happened because people said, it's the death of Ethereum, it's the death of this blockchain, there's problems here. But look at where we are now. So it went down to, it was riding around 10, 10, 10 to 15. Yeah. Now the combined value of Ethereum and Ethereum Classic is 50, so it's four times, uh, three, four times more than it was before the fork. So what it shows is a fork can actually be managed, uh, and a fork can actually happen and actually add to the value of the owners of the original before the fork to both. Um, and uh, that, that's our point. Our point of view, Vitoro, is if this fork is managed and communicated properly, and every participant knows what he does post the fork, the fork can actually be a good thing. Why? Because you'll have two development teams working together, uh, copying from one another, both running open source competing and competing with each yeah. other. So we'll have two prices, one Bitcoin Unlimited, one Bitcoin Core, they're BTC and BTU, two prices. So in general, it could be actually a good thing for the ecosystem because it might unlock the stagnation uh, of the current problem-solving issues of Bitcoin it could solve some of the politics by creating competition. Yeah, uh, effectively, it's another cryptocurrency to trade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but like Ethereum, it could go, it could end the same way, which is that one of them is massively decreased in value and one massively goes up. But nobody really knows which way it's going to go because if you increase block size, then sure, that means you can do more transactions and such, but then miners have less incentive to mine because they're earning less from those transactions um, because the fees will be lower. So it'll be, honestly, I don't know which one um, would succeed more in that, in that case. Um, it's basically just gonna be an experiment, <laughs> which is why I'm sitting on the sidelines until just after the experiment and then right. I can pick my sides. <laughs> Though, again, our, our assumption, and it's only an assumption, uh, nobody can know what 
will eventually happen is that since the exchanges, I think who controls, I think the core in itself, a very good chance Bitcoin is Bitcoin is still going to be called core. And if you add on top of that, that all of the exchanges, or most of them, are saying we'll consider Bitcoin core as the original Bitcoin, yeah. I assume that post the fork will have Bitcoin, the original Bitcoin it will be Bitcoin Core. Yeah. Um, people, even if the hashing power of Bitcoin Unlimited will be higher, miners, you know, miners are, are economic uh, beasts, so <laughs> they're going to mine both. Yeah. Right. They're going to mine whatever generates for them more money, and and quite frankly, most mining power today, no, but like. It, it, also, it is already as secure as we want yeah, it. So yeah. even if miners split into two and don't do both and have to do Bitcoin Unlimited and have to do Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is still extremely secure. So yeah. that's not a real issue. So as long as we know Bitcoin is Bitcoin, I don't see a reason why the price of Bitcoin will significantly decline. Again, it can go down, you know, in Bitcoin the word significantly decline is problematic. So it could go down fast to 700 yeah. or 800, but I don't see how Bitcoin Core could go down to 50. Um, yeah. Although, you know, it's a scenario, but I think it's a, it's a far-fetched scenario because most Bitcoin, I, but most Bitcoiners I talk to still think Bit, the original Bitcoin is the Bitcoin. They, they, they won't dump it yeah. because now they don't believe in Bitcoin, right? Yeah. No, I mean, Plus, I, again, I'm sort of in the middle of um, in the middle of the debate because I believe that larger block sizes are useful, but that Segwit and the core team themselves are much more reliable, have a much better track record of, of good development. So I think there's opportunities in both. Uh, as you said, I don't think there's any chance that, that either of them are going to go to zero. Um, I think they're they're probably going to survive and sit quite stable until people really discover, okay, how does this actually affect the economics of each coin? You know, is one now better for transactions and as a currency, and is one better as a store of value? Because all that could happen is that you, you then see those two different parties that are using Bitcoin for those two different elements pick their sides and use them for those two different purposes. Both could be successful. Liam, what do you think about the fork? Uh, well, I think whatever happens, we'll see, you know, the sum of the two products, Core and Unlimited. The sum of the value of those will be less than what Bitcoin currently is, you know, initially. But like you say, the value of Ethereum and Ethereum Classic combined increased, you know, massively, say fivefold. There's no reason why Bitcoin can't follow the same the same path. So, yeah, because it, it is in itself the currency, whereas Ethereum is more of a platform. You know, they have different aspects to them. But yeah, I agree. The uh, the combined price could definitely rise in the future. But you're also like Jay saying that in the short term, if there's going to be a fork, we're going to see the combined price first going down before it's going to go up. I think so. Not not massively, but you know enough to not want to be buying at that time. Interesting. So. First, since I own Bitcoin in my account, I hope you're both wrong. Um, <laughs> but, but, but sort of my experience, I remember uh, when uh, there was a big of a turmoil uh, around Europe, and uh, that was the first time there was a Bitcoin. Yeah. So uh, just before that, there was a, a potential fork, if you remember. Yeah, I remember that. There was a potential fork, and I, again, sold. Because I said, ah, there's a potential fork. There, it wasn't a fork, it was a bug. It was actually a bug. And they had to fork the code in order to get in. And I'm like, okay, I'm out of here because <laughs> everything could collapse. And then at the same time, there was a bailout in Europe. And basically, the <laughs> price of Bitcoin went up like 200% in a month. So uh, I was left uh, without that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's a good thing that we bought a, a detour with some bitcoins and already, always left them. So I have been trading in and out, in and out, but there we just kept them as is locked <laughs> in cold storage. Um, 
Well, Liam, we didn't get a chance to uh, go over your strategy earlier. Jay touched on it. Sounds like from you know the conversation that we have a volatile year ahead. As traders, we shouldn't be afraid of volatility. We need volatility to trade. So, how do you plan to trade it in the net if throughout 2017? Bitcoin and Ethereum. What's your strategy? Yeah, exactly. Um, at the moment, I'm just holding on Ethereum. Uh, we've had a lot, a big swing recently, but the price is flattened out so you know just holding them in in the red a little bit at the moment but that's absolutely fine you know I think over the next few months with like Casper hopefully coming along uh, moving from proof of work to proof of stake uh, we should see some kind of price rise in that scenario um, so yeah while the price is flat or down just buy more that's my. Uh, why, why, that's do Casper, why do you think Casper? Why do you think Casper is going to move the price up? Casper is what we talked about before the proof of stake. Uh, so, but well, why do you think that moves the price up? Uh, so, to become someone who's validating transactions as a proof of staker, um, you know, you'll need uh, collateral, which I've heard is around one thousand two hundred and fifty ether. Uh, Ethereum coins, you know, to to become a validator. So, if people want to start validating and acquiring the transaction fees as part of the mining process, you know, there'll be lots of people wanting to acquire large amounts of Ethereum all at once. You know, as soon as the Casper hits, people are going to want to start doing this. And so, what you're saying, once it moves into proof of stake, it'll act sort of like the in the Dash coin, the fact that the master nodes Same need to thing. own a thousand Dash coins holds sort of the entire price because four thousand people owning a thousand each and not willing to sell it holds the entire price up. So what you're saying is that will lead more and more people to want to hold twelve hundred fifty Ethereum, which is fifty thousand dollars worth of Ethereum, in order to basically get what we can consider as interest rate. Right, so it's suddenly Ethereum plus interest rate. Um, so I understand that it's by the way it's interest rate of uh, that that own, you need to be rich of a certain level to get that interest rate. But it, it, is it does it act like interest? So for every twelve fifty Ethereum you will have, you get a specific new amount of Ethereum, or is it per address or or per CPU or something like that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure as to the, you know, multiplicative properties of it, but yeah, you you'd be collecting transaction fees from each uh, verification that you do. So my understanding is that first of all, I think I thought it was going to be a lot lower than that. The last I remember is Vitalik saying that um, he planned to make it as accessible as possible to stop it from just being mega rich people getting richer. Um, I think he put, uh, the numbers that I've read have been closer to 30 Ethereum, um, which is a lot more affordable for people. Um, and actually, part of why I bought some physical Ethereum as well, because uh, if possible, I'd like to, to run one of the nodes. Um, my, in terms of actually running a node, effectively, the only thing stopping you from running multiple is how many computers you have and how much of that. It's a GPU run, right? Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is, yeah. Kind There's of, no ASIC mining in Ethereum. Yeah, ASICs are about the same as, as, as a GPU. Yeah, exactly. So you need so. to have a, a PC with a good enough GPU in order to run Ethereum, and then in theory... To run a node, I'm not sure on that. Um, no, but, but I think it's like you'll need a combination of both proof of work yes. and proof of stake, right? So you'll need that no, but I think you get to choose, though. I don't think... I don't think it's that you have to do the proof of work and the proof of stake at the same time. I'm not sure on this, by the way. I'm just kind of saying what I think is the case, but... I believe that you can either choose to be a miner, or you can choose to be a proof of staker, because that's how it works in Dash. In Dash, you, you download a Dash wallet, just the normal core wallet that comes with Dash, and uh, by writing a bunch of code and changing the debug modes and stuff, you can set it to be a master node. And all you need to do that is a, a Raspberry Pi and a thousand, um, a thousand Dash. What's so in Raspberry Pi? Well, not necessarily a Raspberry Pi, but you need a computer. So it could just be okay. a Raspberry Pi. Okay. Um, it could be a computer that costs you fifty pounds, not a full-on, you know, server or something that I right. guess most people probably imagine Bitcoiners are using. 
Um, whereas mining, I think, is entirely separate, and for that, you do need specialist hardware that is good at mining. So, in Ethereum's case, that would be graphics cards. In Bitcoin's case, that would be uh, ASICs, and in Dash, that's CPUs. Oh, Dash is just CPUs. I believe they Dash, Dash, ASICs, I believe. Um, Dash and Monero are both CPU focused. CPU focused, interesting. You want to give a two minutes about Dash? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can do. Yeah. Um, so Dash is. Um, where, where Bitcoin has 100% of its mining rewards um, given out to the miners who mine, who validate transactions every 10 minutes. Dash, um, first of all, its block time is much shorter, similar to Ethereum. Ethereum, I think, is 15 seconds or something. 17, yeah. Yeah, ridiculously fast. Um, Dash is uh, one and a half minutes. And Dash is split three ways um, for miners. So basically, 10% of it goes into a pot which is used to fund developers. And so the developers who work on improving Dash um, can draw from that pot to basically pay them a salary to work on the code, which is a really good idea and has been copied already by quite a few different um, uh, cryptocurrencies. 45% uh, of it goes towards the miners, and 45% of it goes to uh, proof of stake. And I think Ethereum is heading down the same route. Yeah. So why not? And, and the proof of stake were called, I think, master nodes. Yes. Uh, basically, do three interesting things, which are the three nice uh, features Dash has over Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. One is they run sort of a, a so he said 10% goes to developers, but then you ask, but who decides what do the developers do? The answer is the master nodes. Yeah. So the master nodes have a selection, like a democratic selection process, where they choose which projects to actually pay for development, and that will be added into the code. So everything we see in the problems of Bitcoin today, which is how do we decide what to do and, and what to develop, and uh, how do we increase block size, potentially is there uh, being managed by a group of, uh, I don't know if to call them aristocrats <laughs> or uh, oligarchs of yeah. uh, Dash, who own $100,000 or $120,000 worth of coins, and they are the ones who are actually voting on a democratic manner. A second is uh, that they get interest rate because they get proof of stake. So 45% of the mining power, they actually receive it. So they have an interest of staying. They get paid for, make, for being the government. Uh, and third, is originally Dashcoin, and that I think is somewhat of a problem moving forward, but I'm not sure it seems like they're over it. Originally, it was called Darkcoin. Uh, and the reason it was called Darkcoin is because they added a very interesting feature, which what the master nodes also do is mixing. Uh, and mixing was invented in the Bitcoin uh, uh, community because uh, people say Bitcoin is anonymous, but in fact, Bitcoin is uh, not really not anonymous. Uh, it's called pseudo-anonymous, but in effect, if you're the NSA or the MI6 uh, or, uh, I just heard, by the name, the GHQ something? Well, what's the name? GHQ. Yes, exactly. I just heard about them now from Wikileaks. <laughs> but <laughs> if, if, if you're sophisticated enough to follow all of the Bitcoin transactions, it actually is quite easy because it's a public ledger to find out who transferred who money. So people invent the technology called mixing, so I can actually transfer some Bitcoins to Jay, but moving them through 100 different people. So nobody can actually find out that I pay Jay. Yeah. Um, and that was called mixing. And Darkcoin was initially invented because the master nodes actually do mixing services, so private sense uh, on top of the Dashcoin, uh, which is actually potentially useful in finance, not only in a bad manner, um, but uh, also when uh, you know the JP Morgans uh, of the world are talking about uh, cryptocurrency, they, they are talking about privacy and permissioned uh, ledgers, and actually Dash now is private as cash. Yeah, and Monero is the same thing as well. Monero is also um, a private cryptocurrency, effectively. Yeah, we we at Etoro said we'll, we'll look at adding more cryptos as they reach around the billion dollar level, so we know, so the, the fear is, and we've seen that with some cryptos, I've personally created some cryptos in the past, uh, that sort of went up, but, but then crashed to zero, and we think that's a horrible yes. experience for users in Toro. so we want to see like the crypto stabilizing above 
the billion dollar market cap before we uh, we add it to, to more users around the world. I believe I think Dash was about seven hundred million today. Is that, yeah. is that the market cap right now? So it's nearing that. We we're, mm. we're already looking at that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you told our clients I uh, need to go and do a bit of research on some Dash. Oh. Speaking of which, um, we do have some questions from the clients, so just in case anybody came late. Um, Sebastian is asking, when can we see two times leverage again? On Ethereum, um, we're, we're evaluating it now. Um, well, the reason we removed it was, as you all know, there was huge spikes in volatility. Um, where there are huge spikes in volatility, we, we connect to multiple exchanges, and actually some of the exchanges just, just couldn't take uh, the, uh, the amount of volume we had uh, in Toro. Um, we are looking at it, and hopefully we'll have some news next week. Perfect. And uh, Huang Hai is asking, what about the Lightning Network? So very briefly, Jay, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so the Lightning Network is actually, um, that's one of the technologies that's been worked on by the core team primarily. For Bitcoin. Um, yes, for Bitcoin. Um, and it's basically, it basically enables off-chain transactions. Um, it's, it's a way of avoiding the problem of incredibly high fees for sending Bitcoins everywhere by simply not transferring them necessarily via the blockchain and instead doing it via potentially other blockchains. Um, so in theory, if, if uh, you could set up a contract on Ethereum whereby you transfer Ethereum and stuff and that is representative of Bitcoin, um, and there are plenty of other little solutions like that that you can do. Uh, there's also private ways of doing it. So like um, companies such as Coinbase, for example, who, who are very well known because the Bitcoin space and very large could in theory just move it between their own internal wallets and just sort of reassign it. Um, that's effectively what Lightning is and what it enables. Um, I'm not entirely sure how it works, but that's the gist of like the principle of what it is. So, so two things. One, we said before, there's a reason miners prefer Bitcoin and Limited and not Bitcoin Core. That's the reason. Mm. So the seg yeah. with, segregated with this feature in the Bitcoin Core, which was supposed to propagate already and hasn't been able to propagate, is that it, that's the, what enables Lightning Network. Lightning Network works as a payment channel. So you basically lock up Bitcoins between two participants. So you say, here are Bitcoins, we lock them up, and it opens sort of like a credit line. So these two participants can now do a thousand transactions outside the blockchain, but they still have the security of what they locked up. So that's how it works as payment channels. Uh, but the miners, who are the ones who define What's the what are the features actually going in because they define what's the longest block? Uh, it seems they're they're pushing it away because the economic benefits are, are not in their favor yeah. if Lightning Network and, and SegWit uh, actually happen. Okay, and lastly, Gabzi is asking, how will Ethereum disrupt the banking system? <laughs> uh, everywhere imaginable, probably eventually. Uh, <laughs> So Ethereum, as I said just now, in theory you can set up assets on it. So the NASDAQ stock exchange could be entirely replaced by um, a series of smart contracts on Ethereum. Um, so that would put an awful lot of um, people out of a job, effectively. Uh, so as well as doing stocks, um, you can do, as I said earlier, ride-sharing apps. You can do basic, any, any app or smart application that's going on on a mobile phone at the moment that's currently run by a company could in theory be run on Ethereum, decentralized, removing any extra fees, um, making it cheaper and more efficient um, for the end user. Again, there's uh, decentralized autonomous organizations as well, which quite famously resulted in the first fork in, um, in a cryptocurrency, a uh, major cryptocurrency at least, which was the Ethereum fork. Uh, again, those so those companies basically um, can be set up to do all sorts of things entirely autonomously without any human input whatsoever, and that's that's kind of one of the unique fe features. So uh, it's possible to set up, for example, uh, a Bitcoin bank that is run on Ethereum with nobody that actually works at the bank. Uh, so so long term, and you can imagine why the bankers aren't supporting that too much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is this is why there's there's such a sort of mad rush by the banks to try and understand the technology, see if they can use it to their advantage, and see if, because of course, 
if, if they keep some control at least, then for them it makes more sense to make things more efficient. If they can get rid of a, a bunch of staff in order to do, automate everything, then why wouldn't they? Um, but at the same time, they're also scared because if this happens in a decentralized and open format, then why do people need the banks in the first place? So I think I, I've been talking to a lot of the big banks, um, and, and they're all super excited about the opportunities in blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, we've met through with the, you know, all of the teams and all the build bulk brackets uh, about blockchain. So uh, what they're currently looking at is, is using blockchain technology to replace first a lot of the backend. Yeah. So the first thing is, uh, uh, you know, a lot, still a lot of processes in banks go through like three different people, uh, you know, eight years ago it was still with pen and paper doing like V, 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 like daily reconciliation. So reconciliation is a very long process. That's why stocks settle only T plus two, because there's actually, they're waiting for people to actually press enter yeah. and look at two numbers and see that they match. Uh, so that's the... Core thing, we're already seeing some banks, we're seeing the Australian Stock Exchange uh, working with digital asset holdings to try and rebuild some of uh, their infrastructure, replace a 35-year-old infrastructure of the Australian Stock Exchange <laughs> written in COBOL by, block exchange, by blockchain and stuff. Um, so I think it'll, it'll take a time for the existing big banks until we see features that are uh, client-facing I even say client facing as Etoro is a client of a lot of big banks. It'll take them time before they actually externalize stuff even for other financial institutions. First, people will use this technology to improve internal processes. Then they'll use this technology to communicate with other institutions like Etoro. And only then they will create uh, applications that actually reach consumers. Now, in, and in parallel to that, you're going to have the entire crypto banking industry, which are outside the realms of, uh, uh, of the existing industry. So it's a question of, of who will reach the consumer first with the killer app, the, the crypto world or, or the banking world? Because right now, they're both running in, in the same direction. They both want to disrupt this world and improve all of the processes, but one has no... Uh, hundreds of thousands of employees on, the, on their back, uh, and regulators and government, uh, but also doesn't have any clients and money on it. So th that's the biggest hurdle of, of the crypto world, is it's actually very hard to move money, real money, into that world. Actually, real money can't move to that world. <laughs> or, or, I don't know, real money or, or bank money, so bank money versus digital money. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you know, before we see banks moving over to these kind of things, we'll, we'll probably see like, you know, the crypto eBay pop up and platforms like that where it's going to attract the banks in to, to kind of take part in these in these things. So, yeah, like crypto yeah, eBay, exactly. crypto poker sites, stuff like that is, is yeah. the future. Well, well, and obviously here we're, we're, we're a webinar of eToro, <laughs> so we're, we are uh, an example of, of something in the middle, right? So we're a big company, 350 employees, regulated in several jurisdictions and continents, uh, work a lot with regulators, um, try to explain. I, I'm giving lectures to regulators about blockchain. Um, and on the other hand, uh, some users a lot of ask us, why don't we let people withdraw money uh, in, in, in Bitcoin or Ethereum? And the answer is, uh, if, if from an anti-money laundering perspective, that's very complicated. Uh, because how do you know when you send someone to an address Bitcoins, whether it's his really or somebody else's? And if it's somebody else's, there's potential for anti-money laundering. So we as a financially regulated company said we don't want to deal with that specific part um, because we want to stay regulated, of course. And if you look at what happened in the exchanges in China, the exchanges in China actually now are working like eToro. Yeah. So you can deposit funds in fiat currency, you can trade the Bitcoin and different cryptocurrencies, but you can't withdraw anything in, in cryptos. You can only withdraw back in, in new one as well, uh, which, which is exactly like how we operate. So you, you saw the, the big Chinese regulator go into all the exchanges and tell them, please operate like eToro. 
uh, which is nice. Um, oh, oh, what? <laughs> those were the words. <laughs> in, in, in China, it's ito rei, so a bit different. But 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 we are seeing regulators also publish uh, yeah, the European regulators, U.S. regulators, Singapore regulators have all published articles on the benefits of what they call, by the way, not Bitcoin or blockchain. So the, the what they call it is DLT, distributed ledger technologies, um, and and they see all of the benefits coming from that. But it, it'll take time before it will propagate within the traditional finance industry. So 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 we have the opportunity to to become that crypto eBay. <laughs> Any final thoughts, gentlemen? By Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, well, thanks everyone for joining. I think it's been a, another very informative webinar. Thanks very much, guys. If you liked what Jay or Liam had to say, you can check out their profiles on the platform under Jay Nemesis or Liam Davies. In addition, if you wish to trade Ethereum, go to our markets page or just search it in the search bar. Uh, if you wish to further discuss this call in any greater depth, please contact your account managers. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Thanks.